Yeah, we're live. It is 106 in the afternoon, in the p.m., I guess. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Time to get busy. Talk about crazy stuff. I'm going to close this a little bit, see if we can get a little better light over there. Turn on my light source. My illumination. Let's see what that does. Ah, look at that. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not going to like that. Yeah, we're at 5%. That's okay. That is good. Uh, today, we're going to talk about injector position. I'm going to show you some photos that I have of testing that I did on that Honda that I was talking about with my sliding injector rail setup, and then show you that what's cool about that is not just that. That's kind of cool, the, the you know, changing the injector and, and, and aiming the injectors into the air hat to um, or into the radius air, air horn on, on an individual runner uh, in, you know, injection setup you know, basically a stack side draft deal on a B series Honda, but also that particular one from TWM had two other positions that we could mount the injector. So when I show you the photo, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. You can take a look at it and see you go, Oh yeah. My question is, and something I didn't test because we didn't drill out. There is a position where no injectors are normally at and the where, where they are on a factory in this case, a B series Honda down at the basically intake manifold flange, right where it bolts to the cylinder head. So the injectors go in right there, presumably at the right angle, go into the port, inject fuel in, and the way you go and you make power. On the TWM piece, in fact, we can I can show that to you now. I'll bring, bring you guys around here. So on the TWM piece, I'll bring you guys around here. You can see here, these are the stacks. This is one of the injector positions. And what I'll do is just show you the other one. This is normally where they run it. And I think honestly for the TWM guys, that's probably part of why they're they're making power. You can see I have a secondary fuel pump just hooked right into the rail there with alligator clips going over to the, to the battery because that's how I roll. But if we take a look at the, this is the setup and this is the thumbnail. So this is a Super Richie slider injection system. We've got tubes here. we got sliders on it. These are the injectors and this is our rail and the whole thing and the injectors are held in by clips so that the fuel pressure doesn't push them out. But this thing, whole thing slides in and out so we can move the position of the injector where it's spraying into the air horns. But one of the things I wanted to show you is this right here is where the previous photo that I showed you where the, where the uh, injectors are normally but there's also an undrilled provision right here, right at the flange. So the injectors could go here or here this far up the runner or where I have them on the outside. So all of those things are possible with this TWM setup. I'm going to go ahead and show you the, like I said, all, all of those are possible with the TWM setup. And this is testing that I did on the chassis dyno on, on, a, on a, you know, fairly good size or fairly healthy B16. This thing ended up making 211 or 212 at the tire way back in the day with this injection setup with the Super Richie sliding uh, with, with this injection on it. Um, and that helped quite a bit. That was about 11 horsepower or so. Yeah. Look, you can see me. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and Hook this back up, hook it up, buttercup. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think about the different injector positions? My question is, and I didn't test this, I didn't drill out the holes and put the injectors down where they are on every other B-series intake manifold, or down basically at the flange. I didn't run them there. We did run them in the other spot and, and from basically almost midway up the runner and then move them out. What I'm wondering now, having done this test long ago, moving them up where they did uh, from TWM, would we have gotten a gain in power? And, and this probably will be our poll for today.
Okay, would a mid runner position for the injector add power compared to being, you know, positioned by the cylinder head? So if it was all the way down by the head and we moved it up halfway as compared to where I put it, would we gain power? Would there be some power there over having it by the cylinder head? Because we would get, you know, essentially more time for cooling. Let me know what you guys think. Would that happen? Would a, would a little bit of a change in injector position make a little bit of power? And then where I put it was all of the power. The other thing I wanted to talk about is on this injector positioning, because we've talked about this before, but what I wanted to talk about was, let me know, especially the tuners that are here, what do you think about injector timing? So when we move the injector farther away from the head port, do we have to adjust injector timing? I can tell you, <laughs> so you know, I didn't do any of that on this test. All we did was move the injector. Um, I ha We were tuning it with a Honda but I didn't change the injector timing at all. In fact, all we did was adjust, adjust it so that we had the right air fuel ratio. So let me know what you guys think about injector timing. And then also just as a theoretical, you know, <laughs> hypothetical goal, like thought of, what am I trying to think of? A thought equation? No, that's not it. Um, what happens if we move the injector really far out, like on a really long runner? Um, do, do we like, let's say it was a 10 or 15 inch runner, like on the, that, that big super rich adjustable manifold that I showed, if we put something inside that and had really long runners, would we have to change the ejector timing in order to do that? The farther away we move it from the valve, do we want it to arrive at this, at a certain time? Do we want injection to start a little earlier on a longer runner? What do you guys think? <laughs> what do you what do you think happens? I'm curious. It's a thought experiment. That's what I was that's what I was trying to think of and I knew that uh, eventually I would get there. 78% are saying yes. I'm just curious. I've done some testing with injector position and moving the injector, the injector placement and we know that it makes power. We know it did on this one, we know it did on the Volkswagen. We, we know that it does do that. And we see that to some extent on a carbureted application, running port injection versus running a carburetor, we get more power usually from the carburetor. And if we could get the carburetor to have perfect fuel distribution or get the intake manifold to have perfect fuel distribution, it's actually not the fault of the carburetor. If we could get that to happen, then we could have safety and extra power. But in doing that, we see that that happens. But does it happen a little bit if we only move it a little bit? Does it happen a lot if we move it a lot? And then what happens if we go big? What happens if we move it really, really far away? Like on the, if you look at the like Sonic Rams for the the weird cross ram deals for that Dodge did where the carburetors are over the valve cover area or over the fender well, essentially. Really, really long, like three foot long runners. What happens with those? Do we have... Do we get more cooling from that? Is is we know that the gain, you know, low speed power gain is from reflected waves on really long runners. We see that all the time, whether it's fuel injected or carbureted. But what happens with the carburetors when we put carburetors out there, or if we were to put injectors out there, because they're longer, do we get more cooling? Does it does it stop at some length? Like, does it do all the cooling that it could possibly do and give you all the power that it could at some point? basically some time frame. And then if we're looking at that as a time frame thing, like how much time it takes for the for the fuel to be injected and then cool and then make it into the port, all this is happening pretty fast, remember. Um <laughs> does this change at different RPMs then? Do we get better cooling at one RPM than another RPM? So do we get theoretically better gains? So should we adjust our injector timing to get more cooling? you know, for different engine speeds, there's a lot of cool stuff to think about here. And I don't, <laughs> I don't have time to test all of it, but it would be cool to do that. Wisconsin's in the house. Boosted boys went full billet block on the MR2. Good old VTEC. Yep. This was not an H22 or an H23. This was a, oh, are you asking about the boosted boys thing? But this was a B series. I feel the VTEC kicking in from here. Yep. Bah, bah. T20. 
Moving them only an inch or two upstream makes a little difference. Trying to measure it would be like separating pepper from fly squat. Closer to the combustion chamber helps cool cylinder temps. I don't know, Mike. Is that are you asking that or are you are you stating that? If the charge air is cooler going in, we know that it, that does happen. It makes more power. Wouldn't that cool the combustion chamber? Individual trim and optimal injector location has got to be worth some power. You, you have to change the injector timing for optimum results. Still can't vote in the polls. <laughs> What's going on, Eric? I wonder why the poll's not working. On my 2JZ, plus 45 degrees of injector timing skews Lambda by 5 or 6%. You can change it by 45 degrees? If you have big cam injector timing helps keep the fuel from blowing out on overlap. We did see standoff while we were testing this. And, and you would see that anyway, because that's that's actually a natural occurrence. And we saw, you could see the fuel standoff when we're running and it changes it obviously at RPM. I would think injector timing would only clean up low RPM throttle response. I hate cross ram intakes. Cross ram intakes are, are, are the are it, man. I think the moment of injector spray would be best at the exact moment the air is being drawn into the intake. I think it's going to depend on whether the fuel stays atomized. I like the cross frame ideas, just mission to give them a bad rep. It's all compromised power, throttle response, packaging, emissions. I also think that idle quality might suffer injectors on the outside of, of the throttle butterfly. It it does. I mean, having the injector placement here, the idle quality definitely was not as good as having the injector down at the port. I mean, admittedly, I didn't spend a whole bunch of time trying to make this thing drive around. We never drove it around like this. Um, but the idle quality is definitely different than having a B16 manifold on there. Richard, remember the five-liter intake that had the injector bosses on the back of the plenum? Yeah, Celine had theirs. I remember Kip from Turbo Magazine drilled his out and put the extra rail back there. And I remember telling him that that's, that's not going to make any difference. That's just silly. Why would you do that? Because I knew nothing about charge cooling. That's why he was going to do it. I was like, the fuel's already getting in there. It's getting in there at each port. And now it's not going to get in there evenly under each port. And, and while that might have been somewhat true, um, I don't know that it was, but because we didn't ever do 802s on anything. But there was definitely charge cooling from that. But his looked cool, too, having the extra rail on there with the eight injectors in the back. So... It's a lot of packaging, though. But he had all the cool stuff because, you know, when you're the publisher of the magazine, people throw stuff at you. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. That was a cool test. I A lot of times I have to throw these things together. And you could see I had a, we had a, I think that was a T-Rex pump, if I remember right, stick that we had to put a, another fuel pump in because we only had the stock. I think we had the stock SI pump in there at the time. And I'm like, I don't really want to change the pump. We're like, oh, we could do this. I said, we could, I have it. I have a pump and we have a rubber line here. I said, I'm just cutting this rubber line and I'm just sticking this thing in the middle because it had barb fittings on both sides. And like, yeah, but how are you going to turn it on? I said, I got alligator clips. I am not afraid to use alligator clips. Fogger nozzles would also have charge cooling. Definitely. Done a bunch of testing on Australian V8 supercar engines. That's those are the real deal. Injector height, angle, position, timing swings from 120 to 1400 degrees. Are is the 1400 degrees EGT that you're talking about, or that should that be 140 degrees?
Mike, I was under the impression that if you co use cold fuel to cool the combustion temperatures, then you do so. I figured get the injection as close as possible. I was hoping for your affirmation. I think that that's incorrect. I mean, judging by the results of this test, having the injector close doesn't add power. Having it far away adds power. Uh, your thumbs up symbol, symbol is not working, Eric. Pre-cycle injection. Has anybody ever heard of injection of, of supplying so much fuel that fuel builds up on the back of the valve as raw fuel and then gets released into the combustion chamber. Somebody was talking to me about that and I, I, I've never seen that happen. I've done, we've done like we did a bunch of stuff on the end on the chassis dyno where we had a strobe and a camera and we were watching the thing because we could see all the way down in on this motorcycle engine was awesome. We could see all the way down in. we could see the valve. We could see the injector pulsing. We could see the fuel like swirling around the valve and, and some being on the outside and stuff because of the way that the injector angle was. But there was never any like raw fuel built up on the back of it. And I don't know if that's just because this was more of a production deal, if this is something that happens at high horsepower stuff. Seeing fuel crystallize on the back of the injector. Uh, that, yeah, but what I'm talking about is this guy was saying that while you're running and making power, that fuel puddles on the backside of the valve, like <laughs> a fairly deep puddle, lots of fuel. And then when the valve opens, that this extra fuel goes in while it's running. It doesn't make sense to me. Batch fire, I guess, kind of does that, right? That's a good point. Let's see if I can fix my camera. But batch fire doesn't, is not fuel build up for power though. Fuel pooling on the back of the valve heats up and is good for emissions, not great on large overlap cams. I just want to see all of this stuff in operation. <laughs> I want to have the little bore scope looking in there and monitoring all that. I like to see it. It's easy, easier to understand that when you could see it in action. Might have some videos on that. Cool, 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 cool. Watching the motorcycle engine do its thing at, I don't know, 13,000 RPM, whatever this 600 was revving to, it was pretty cool. I think fuel may puddle on the intake valve and some might be left over after the intake because of the high inertia of the fuel itself and the elasticity of the air column. That's inertia ram. I voted yes on the poll. Way to go, special agent. That's a way to be positive. Intake valve should be hot enough to vaporize fuel. I would think it's got a lot of combustion temperature on the front side of that valve on the face. Did the old Hillborn injection with the mechanical fuel pump do something like that? It may have. It, like I said, I, I would kind of like to see it doing that. I just don't know with what I'm thinking in my mind is if you have raw fuel on the backside of the valve and the valve opens up, that can't be atomized very well unless it's getting atomized from temperature or something. 
I'm just not, uh, I'm not too hip on that. The video that I worked on this morning and I'm editing it now is uh, different, different types of boost. When I did the original uh, B16 intake test or the blower and blower and turbo test, um, I didn't run the lower boost level stuff and I wanted to include that. So I just did another video on the lower boost stuff so you guys could see it's, it's a little bit better than the 10 pound stuff. Unfortunately, on the 10 pound stuff, when I did that test, excuse me, we had um, on the Jackson Racing Supercharger, we had belt slippage because we had to adjust, you know, blowers are, <laughs> you're trying to adjust pulleys to what I wanted them to be is all 10 pounds. Okay, that's great. With the with the turbo, it's not too hard. It was actually harder at seven pounds because we just ran it on the gate. So it had a seven pound spring in it. So we got near seven pounds. It wasn't exactly seven pounds as it turned out, it was seven and a half pounds. When we went to 10 pounds, we could get 10 pounds from the turbo, but getting 10 pounds exactly from the Vortec and 10 pounds exactly from the Jackson Racing Supercharger turned out to be problematic. Particularly with the Jackson Racing Supercharger, we had belt slippage at the top. So we could get most of the curve to be right. And then at the top, it fell off and kind of short changes the Jackson Racing Supercharger. It's not gonna, that blower's not gonna make as much power as the other things are as, as much, certainly not as much peak power as the Vortec or, or the turbo because, well, the turbo doesn't have a parasitic loss associated with driving it. And the Vortec had an air to water intercooler and also had the long runner intake manifold where the Jackson Racing Supercharger has a dedicated, very, very short runner open plenum like is common on a lot of roots applications, whether it's a four cylinder or a V8 or six cylinder stuff too. Um, and so no intercooler and a short runner intake manifold that had things going against it. And then it had belt slippage <laughs> to, to add to that. So it was a problematic, Le much less of a problem with the seven pound setup. So good data on the, on the boost curves and the power curves and all that. So lots of cool stuff to talk about. Big power needs cog belts. Yeah, this is, this is 200 horsepower. So it's not, not really that much, but it's still problematic. Cause I think that I'm thinking that those might've even been, um, and I can look at the photos here and see those might've even been like, like four rib pulleys. So they were, um, you know, let me see here. So they would be, you know, they would be much more prone to slippage. Slip slide no way. Honda photos. Turbo matrix. B series boost bash. So let's see, not that one, not that one, not that one. Here we go. Yeah, the blower pulley for the Jackson Racing Supercharger. We had a variety of different pulleys. We had four different ones, four different blower pulleys at any rate. But they're four ribs, so, you know, we, we could do a better job if it was a six rib, you know, because I think that the, isn't the factory B-series one? No, that was a four rib also. That's, that's part of the problem. Slip slide, no way. I talked to a guy that tuned centers and he said you can't change ignition timing. It's a suggestion only, so that's why I'm having trouble with it. What do you mean you can't change ignition timing? You can't, you, what are you tuning it with? Or the one guys are spraying from above the trumpets for a long time. Yeah, that's where all this came from. If you had done a show of NA motor restricting exhaust, adding back pressure to see how that decreases horsepower. We've done a test on exhaust systems. So we ran, um, and well, shorty headers don't really do that. But we ran a test with long tube headers and then three inch exhaust and three inch um, free flow mufflers. And then we put a complete two and a half inch, uh, you know, exhaust all the way back to the axles on it. And it did lose power. It lost 10 or 11 horsepower, I think. 
And so that that adds back pressure and, and, and it will de decrease horsepower. Back pressure is not beneficial. <laughs> it's, it's definitely detrimental. Uh, Turbo Center, how come you can't pull timing with HP tuners? I thought that you could control both with that. I'm not an expert on HP tuners, but that was my understanding. How's our poll doing? 76% with 41 votes in. Would a mid-runner position for injector add power compared to being in the cylinder head? So they think a little bit of a change will make a little bit of a change in power. If I tell it 20 degrees max, it will start at 20 and keep going up until it knocks. Can you tell it to start at zero and then it'll only go to 20? That's um, that's unfortunate. You need to be able to not have too much timing because it's just going to keep breaking stuff. Uh, Centra, does, is the motor you're working on, does it have a distributor? No, no distributor. Okay. And how do you know, are you monitoring the, the timing? How do you know that it's going up that high? I wonder if back pressure would help on a two stroke. Obviously they're very sensitive to um, exhaust design on a two stroke, but I don't know about back pressure though. Oh, live data. Okay, you're are you're actually data logging it. Okay, that's cool. Cool, cool, cool. That's weird. Does anybody have anything for Turbo Center to try to figure out what's going on? You have to retard the cam or something to, to change the timing. <sighs> I'm doing catch up, but uh, the fuel puddling on the valve, War Perception did a video with his GoPro inside his plenum on his Turbo Supra running 85. It was cool to see. I'm talking to DIY Auto Tune. Those guys should be able to help you out. So on the day log, is there a modify for ignition on another table? Yeah, is there something else controlling it? Dang modifiers. Yeah, you you definitely want to... Timing is way more important even than fuel, so... That, that's going to break a motor a lot quicker. Uh, Jake, you can't post a picture here. You can you can email it to me though. You can email it. I'll um, put my email down here. Should be right. Yes. I just put my email down, Jake. Seventy six percent. I'd like to see what the difference is, and I'd like to see what the difference is changing the injector to a really long runner. I want to see if that helps. I really want to change injector position on that 5.3 with the Brian Tooley 
um, Trinity intake manifold, or or maybe try it on a high RAM and see. I was a little concerned when you see the if you 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 guys have most of you guys have seen the photo that I put up earlier, but if you see the photo, I was a little concerned with how close the injectors were because that's where it wanted to make the best power. I was concerned. I started to get concerned about airflow. Am I, am I hurting the airflow having the injector right in the, taking up the middle of the, that port, but it all wanted to wrap around. Dodger on perimeter, huh? You, you get them attack. So what's everybody doing this weekend? Got any cool things planned? Any cool stuff? What SUV should I buy? Two liter gas turbo GDI or 2.2 turbo diesel for performance and mileage? Well, I think the gas is going to have the edge on performance, right? And then the diesel is going to have the edge on mileage. SHB tuners for helping. They said they couldn't do anything about it. It's weird that they would say, uh, yeah, you can use this to adjust fuel <laughs> and you can't do it for timing because that's an emissions thing. Fuel is an emissions thing too. New to nitrous. Is it true? Nitrous fouls. If you're going to say plugs, the answer is no. Not if the tune is right. Body work on my 91 Corvette. Nice. Radiator on my caravan. Is the caravan a, a turbo? Teach me how to build a motor with dual gas street methanol drag setup. Are you going to have two fuel systems on that? Nitro nitrous fouls up your oil. Mm, no, um, other kinds of fuel will E85 can and methanol can, but not not nitrous. What's the best mechanics hand cleaner? I I like Dawn soap. Working on my CT70, nice. Hope to work on the RAV4. Do you think diesel is still a good option even when they come with DPF and have you put it and have to put definite? That would anger me <laughs> to have to do that. And also diesel is not cheap, man. The fuel is not. I got a shifter cart with a 150 Honda swap going. That's very nice. Did the first run of it. Video is up on my channel. Shameless plug. No, that's good. You should do that. That's why you're here, man. I, I want to watch it. Carts are cool. Snap off has some good hand cleaner. Came across your videos with you experimenting things with the L67 3.8 supercharge. I wanted to see if you've ever found a replacement supercharger for that motor. A replacement, what do you mean? Something like an upgrade? I put a twin screw Kenny Bell on one. I made an adapter plate. And you could do that same thing for, there are other guys that have done bigger blowers on there. You could put it, uh, an M122 or a, uh, an M M112. You know, it's just a matter of getting the plate on there correctly. And like I said, I did a, I think the one I did was a 2.1 liter Kenny Bell twin screw. And putting that on made a big difference in power. If, but if I was going to do that again, I, I would do one and I would incorporate an intercooler too, because it, it, that's really what that thing needs. Actually, it just needs a turbo, <laughs> then turbo with an intercooler and it's all fine.
Rusty ran 51 on an NA barrel last Sunday down the quarter. Completely stocked, 3.9 diff. Looking at doing 100 shot rather than boost first. That'll make a big difference. What's the, what's the, Rusty, what's the vehicle weight? And then what was the mile an hour on that? And what year Barra is that? Reach out to Kenny Bell and they said they discontinued the supercharger. Yeah, they they never made that kit. That's something I did, but they don't have that smaller blower. I I, I know that they have a two six, which would, <laughs> should be really big for that, but it would work. Um, I just don't know if there's room for that. They do have a little one that I saw because when I sent the AMR five hundred blower over. They were testing like a one liter one, but that wouldn't be big enough for a, an, a, to replace an M90 though. Looks like a separate gasoline set of injectors and a separate set of methanol injectors. Yeah. It depends on how your fuel system is. You could have dual injectors that are not one's not dedicated for one and one dedicated for the other. You could have the system set up so that you're feeding. You'd have to have a Y in there though, because with methanol, you, you might need both injectors. You might need the flow rate of both injectors, unless you have really gigantic injectors in your methanol set. 2008 Ford Falcon BF3 wagon, 92 miles an hour. 1630 kilogram curb weight. Very cool. Congratulations on your 15, 15, one, you're, you're close to a 14. So you got to put at least a 50 shot in it so that it runs 14. That's what happens is at least 51 is not 15. One is not a 1502 or 1501 or 15.0. Cause that gets frustrating. Anything O is not good because then you want the the previous nine. A nine nine with a nine. All right, getaway. We'll see you later. Go get pizza and any freeze. <laughs> That's a good combination. Hundred shot takes me near low fourteens. I I a hundred shot could do more than um could do more than one second on a 15 second car. It depends how early you're hitting it. And I would be surprised if you don't go a, a more than a hundred miles an hour. Your trap speed isn't more than a hundred miles an hour. It's my project car from high school. I started with my dad, which is 2004 Chevy Impala SS. Nice. I want to push as much power out of it without throwing a turbo or going LS4 from the GXP. The thing you're going to have to worry about, I think, is the transmission on that thing. We'll need to get off street tires if I want to hit it off the line. Yeah, I know you don't have to hit it off the line, but... You know, that would be the thing is managing the traction so that you could be on it for as long as you can. Hundred shot on a 15 second car. Yeah, it's going to be a lot. I mean, it's going to be a lot more than it is on a six second car or seven second car or an eight second car. 15, I, I it might be a full second or more. Again, that would be terrible if it's a 14 0. <laughs> Just bring your drills with you so that you can you can <laughs> drill it out to 150 shot. What do you think about compound turbo setups? Do they give boost at all rev range? And why is it not that common? It's it's unnecessary really on, at least for the V8 guys. And I don't know where you are if you're in America, but for, for bigger displacement V8 stuff, it's not really necessary. Most people with a gas V8 don't want full boost at 2000 RPM. So you don't want to run 
20 pounds at 2000 RPM. It's not a diesel, so they don't want to do that. That's a good way to break something. So it's not really necessary. That's why compound turbos are less common on gas V8s. They're more common, obviously, in the diesel world. But yeah, you can make it so that you can put a giant turbo on there and make lots and lots of power and then have a compound setup so that now that big turbo is going to be more responsive because it also has the small turbo. Motor has 327,000. Are those miles or kilometers on it? Having a real by performance trans shop near where which you can see 40. 40, 80 swaps done to those vehicles. What compression is needed to be able to run both methanol and gas? It, Mike, is this an NA motor or is it a turbo motor or, or a gas motor? <laughs> is it turbo or is it NA? <laughs> this is my question. Have you heard anything about Veraram coming out with a new LS intake manifold? I, I, I'm not in the loop about that. Uh, Three hundred twenty-seven thousand kilometers. That's what I was thinking. Kilometries. That's not a lot. My truck has three hundred twenty-seven thousand miles on it. And I would certainly hit it with a hundred shot if it wouldn't break the glass transmission. Might make one run like that. If the injector is far from the cylinder, it might have better mixture, but maybe it can make some knock detection. Yeah, you'd think it would be less prone to detonation if it's cooling the charge air. But again, I would like to see some dedicated, you know, lab level <laughs> research on that. Because I certainly haven't done it. The chamber should be hot all the time. I, I'd like to see what the running temperature is and and even see what the change in running temperature is, you know, over a acceleration cycle, like, like in the quarter mile or something. Found on our V8 ATBs, an old EV1 injector made more top end power than a modern EV14. Did it have a, Jake, did it have a different spray pattern in those two injectors? Half of Richard's viewers have 5.3s with over 300,000 miles. It's, it's popular, right? And we all think the same thing. Oh, I would boost that in a hot second. I think it's worth boring 30 over on an L67 plus port and polish the head, supercharger and intake. I, I wouldn't worry about boring it. If you're going to change the piston and put a forged piston in there and you want to clean it up, I don't know that I would. On boosted stuff, I don't normally worry about having more displacement. Uh, yes, different injector pattern. That's what I thought. Tabor panel versus four hole screen. Trying to build either or all I can afford is an NA, but I know turbo is, is the way to go. It's just a lot easier to make, you know, to make power and to turn it up to more power and more power and then break it, right? That's what we all want to do. You it's going to be difficult to build an NA motor that will take advantage of methanol and still be able to run on gas because you're, you're going to want really high compression if it's an NA motor to be able to utilize methanol. You know, if you build a nine to one motor, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly about methanol. I can tell you about E85. E85 on an NALS does almost nothing. It does a lot or does more on a LT, does more on a Coyote. And I think that the higher compression will take advantage of that. And I assume that methanol is going to 
operate the same way. Uh, Rex, I don't really understand your question, but the engine's always going to have vacuum. I don't like drawing oil vapor into the motor because it's makes it much more likely to detonate. And if you look inside the intake manifold of an LS, it's full of oil. Probably Hemis are like that too. What's the cranking pressure limit? I don't know. Are you talking about a cranking compression number? We've had cranking compression stuff that's over 200. But I don't, none of those things would I run on 87 octane though. Is anyone ever studied uh, Smoky Unix hot vapor engine? Yeah, the, there are people that bought one on on YouTube and are doing testing on it, but it's <laughs> but it's a turbo motor. Jake, I haven't tried to move the injectors on a either an OEM truck or a or a fast or anything like that. I, I would like to. Um, I think what I'll do is probably try it first on a Holly High Ram just because it lends itself to that. <laughs> that turbo is a homogenizer. Do twin homogenizers work even better? <laughs> Put it in the intake before the throttle body on all eight. I'm on a on the injectors. I I plan on putting it inside the plenum of a high ram, and then that way also I can just take the plenum off and it could run as an IR manifold. Every methyl motor I built was similar to diesel engine compression numbers. I don't think I should put gasoline in anything with more than SAU. Thirteen to one static compression. Well, you can run thirteen to one static compression with a whole bunch of camshaft on pump gas. So. It would be a, it would be what you're asking is more about dynamic compression, maybe. Uh, Rex, the when we run our stuff on the engine dyno, we run um, lines from the valve covers to we don't run them to a catch can, we just run them open. We run a, a line back to the back of the dyno. But you can run them to a catch can. I, just plugging it's not a good idea. You want to build up. You don't want to build up crankcase pressure. We don't want to do that on the engine dyno. <laughs> Eric, that's not fun. I've changed fuel pumps in the um, on the Mustang in the rain out at the Silver State, and it's, it's not fun. And of course, we had just filled the tank up too. And a methanol small box heavy used to run 16 to 1. Yeah, I mean, with methanol, wouldn't you just try to get as much as you could with the available sweat volume and not making a, a, a silly kind of dome that causes problems? 
frame mounted roots blower. No one has done it because of the engine needed as a heat sink. Mm, no, take a look at take a look at Bonneville guys. They front mount the blower and drive it off of the crank, and it's not mounted on the motor. can't imagine that having injectors three inches higher on the runner will cause enough difference in air density and knock resistance that you'd be able to add a meaningful amount of timing. Outside working at customer's pickup, lower control arm, and it's raining. Of course. Please do a Gen 3 Coyote versus LT. I would love to. I already have the LT data, but I don't have, I've never run a Gen 3 Coyote because I don't have one. Yeah, Jake, that's right. It's not it's not adding timing that adds it, that changes the power with injector position. We didn't change timing when we did the test on the Honda. UK is in the house. Couple more minutes. Did you sweep injection timing on the Honda? No, because we only had a we only had a Honda. I don't even know if we could change injector timing. And if we could, I never, I never experimented with that on the Honda. We've tried changing injector timing on the when we run the Holly. And so far, like I, we did some of that when I did the carburetor, batch, sequential, individual cylinder tuning, and we tried injector timing too. And the injector timing showed no power change at all. We could lose power if we went too far, but it didn't show any gain. We, we want it to work. <laughs> we, we want there to be power gains when we try stuff, but it's not always there. Sometimes it is and sometimes it's not. Gen 3 Coyote versus LT is an expensive test. It is. Brian already has all the LT data, but I don't know if they've ever run a Coyote there. I'm searching for something like 13 to 1 static. on your. Is that on your NA motor? I found power between peaks. Okay. We, we take power anywhere. <laughs> Wherever it gains, it gains. That would be fine. Whether it's down low or up top, all that's good. Chasing one or two horsepower. Yeah. We haven't really been looking for that number. I, at least I haven't been since uh, doing the engine master stuff. We were looking for stuff like that. And then when I was doing my engine development for the, for my Del Sol, when we were doing the U S touring stuff, we were looking for stuff like that, but you know, you, not usually on the engine dyno for the stuff that I'm doing, unless we're doing a direct, back-to-back -back test where everything has to be exact. Trying to figure out what I'm up against to build something similar to the drag week guys. <laughs> That's probably true, Bill. You get points for that. Richard, if all your good ideas work, we wouldn't spend this time arguing about it. That's exactly right. 
that and that is part of the fun. I mean, to give people a hard time like this, the, this Coyote LS stuff is just out of hand with all these people. Just you know, everybody thinks that they're making a comment and a mic drop at the same time. Well, this is that this is the absolute thing. No, it's not. It's just another opinion. But I, I like the guys that are good natured about it. Like people should give people hard times. You you should rib your buddies and I and we do. And like when Bernie and I get together. Jimmy and I, whoever, you know, there's no shortage of that, but it's all good natured stuff. A lot of these guys are really ultra defensive about their positions, about whether it's a coyote or whether it's an LS or, you know, it's, it's just funny. Roots blower, 462 valve stock truck intake. Do I remote the intake runner valve? Do I remove the intake runner valve? The, the runner valve is just going to function and, and, gain power at like, I think it was at 2,500 RPM, if I remember right. Um, if the runner valve will still function, I would just leave it where it is and leave it functioning. But if you're running a roots blower, aren't you replacing that manifold? If you're replacing the manifold, the the valve goes with the manifold, so it doesn't matter. Uh, let's see. Can't simplify it down to yes or no to the position of ejector since the thing we're chasing is the best amount of atomization of the fuel. That's actually not what we're chasing. Um, what we're chasing is a change in um, charge temperature. Atomization is obviously important, but the atomization of the fuel is happening um, after as it comes out of the injector. So that should stay constant. The only thing that could happen is it could come out of suspension, I guess, at the distance. But what we're ha what's happening and what happened on this Honda test is you're you're getting um, charge cooling and you're getting charge cooling and you're getting more charge cooling. You're getting more of a gain from the charge cooling than the displacement, <laughs> the air displacement that you're doing by injecting the air into the port. Although I guess it could be argued that injecting it down at the base of the head and the intake flange hitting the valve displaces air too, but does it displace less of the air doing it there? Like as we get closer to it being direct injection, which displaces none of the air, it only goes into the combustion chamber. So the air has, uh, you know, maximum flow. That's all, it's all stuff to talk about. <laughs> I've left a couple of meanish comments to the coyote guys. The coyote guys have no shortage of, of mean comments too. So it's all good. Currently have turbo setups for my motor. I'd rather build a small block and break out. Last of my big block stuff. Is propane LPG injection on gasoline engines a thing over here? Not really. It is in, I know it is in Australia because one of the bearers that I have had the, had the injection set up on it and it was a, an aftermarket one. But I don't really see that here. And I've never tried it. <laughs> Sorry, coyote guys, both for my comments and that you're coyote guys. Boom. In Australia, it's Barra versus LS. Coyote has now entered the chat. Coyote is a great engine. It, it really is. It makes a lot of power. There's no, and that's the thing. It can be good, and the LS can be good too. I think also timing that the injector adds to the fuel to the air adds fuel to the airstream adds mass to the system, and their mo therefore momentum and pressure. If it adds mass, though, did do you think that that would slow it down? I'm an old Chevy motor guy, but the Coyote is super fast and cheap numbers don't lie. Life is healthier without Coyote derangement syndrome. <laughs> you should start an LPG trend. Propane is awesome. I, I guess so. The interesting thing, and this is something that I learned, and this is why I do this, um, 
one of the comments was about, you know, everybody talks about how inexpensive the LS is. And then I did the video on the LS3 and one of the guys was saying, well, you know, LS3s are not cheap. They're like $7,000. I'm like, there's no way. There's no way they cost that much. And then I looked it up and they kind of do. So an LS3 is not a cheap date, which is, you know, that's obviously why I don't ever find them in a wrecking yard. I don't ever snatch up the $500, you know, aluminum LS3 motors. And we're going to close our poll out at 72% saying, yes, they think a minimal change in injector position will have at least some kind of power change. My neck, the woods, coyotes, LS3s, LTs cost the same. You would think that the LS would be less and that the LTs and the coyotes would be similar, but the coyotes have been around a long time. The coyotes have been around since the LS3s. But they just, I mean, think about an LS3. They didn't make very many of those. Like at least Coyotes, and I'm I'm sure that the new ones are continuing, I guess, in trucks. But you want a motor that, a performance motor like a 5.3 or a 4.8 or a 6 liter that they had in trucks. Because they made a million trucks for every one Camaro or Corvette that they made. And the same thing with a Coyote, except that they use those 5 liter Coyotes in trucks. So they should be more available. And if anything, it's going to be funny if this happens, if it hasn't already, that the Coyote guys can talk about, certainly from a truck variant, that a, a truck Coyote engine is going to cost less than an LS3 does. I'll bet you it does. I bet you could find truck Coyotes. If you were going to do these things to it anyway, you could find truck Coyotes for less than you could find an LS3. So the Coyotes are now the low buck deal which would just be awesome for those guys. Uh, LY6 is almost an LS3. It's smaller and lower compression uh, and has a weaker camshaft, but yeah, almost. Don't F1 cars run injectors at the top of the stack? Yes, they do. They ran two of them usually. They would run one down at the port too for like yellow flag driving. And again, as a Chevy guy, I know Fords and the Coyotes respond to boost better. I don't know that that's the case. <laughs> I don't, people say that. And I, and that's, I think that that's a myth that's perpetuated by Coyote guys. Because I think that the Coyote responds the same way that an LS does. If you take, if we take that 450 horsepower Coyote, and I already know because I've done this, and you add boost to it, and then you take that 490 horsepower uh, LS3 and you add boost to it, guess what's going to happen? They're going to respond exactly the same way. So I don't know what people mean by the Coyote responds better. Local high mileage Gen 1 F-150 Coyotes are 4,000. 4,000 for a junkyard motor is our pass, yeah. But where? how much is a LS3? I bet an LS3 is six or seven. So therefore, four is less. So, so the Coyotes are the low buck deal of the century. Not really. Yeah, every motor responds to boost. And and with a few minor exceptions, um, they seem to respond the same way. I was so jealous. I saw somebody get a $200 pull-apart LS3 last week. I've never seen one in a wrecking yard. 2018, I gave $7,200 for a complete LS3 and trans ECU and cats. Do factory LS injectors squirt a stream or do they, they're, they have a, they have a cone, at least the ones that I've, that we've tested on the ASNU machine. Uh, a thousand horsepower from a from a some sort of supercharged or turbocharged either Coyote or LS is not unusual at all. And again, like I said, even with that Gen One, a stock one is starting out at 450. 
So if it starts out there, it doesn't really take very much boost to get to a thousand horsepower. And, and it's the same thing with the LS3. Even if you don't put a cam in it, you just leave the stock cam in it. You're at a thousand horsepower at 15 or 16 pounds. It's not very much. And on that note, it is time to go. As I will see you guys all tonight, maybe, although it's Friday night. It's Friday. You ain't got no job. It's got nothing to do. Exactly. See you guys all later. Bam, 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 bam.